Okay, that's good. Okay, so it's time. All right, so I'm gonna get started. Um, what you see, you know, right here, that's a binary clock. So the top bar is the hour, the bottom bar is the minute. So you can, how many people already know how to do base two to base 10 conversion? Okay, so you can see that it's 17, you know, it's the hour because it's 16 plus one. And then the minute is 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, which adds up to 31. So I know it's time to get the class started. So we'll go over base conversion in this class. It is really important that we understand how to do base conversion and stuff like that in this class. So um, are there any questions before we uh, get started? Because it's, uh, se it's uh, 1732. Yep, go ahead. Yep. So let's double check, okay? So the stream is set up correctly. You know, I'm, I just want to show you, you know, the, the whole thing so you guys can see it. Uh, the stream is seeing itself. That's why you see that you know, kind of recursion thing, okay? It is a form of recursion, you know, which does not terminate until the screen becomes a single dot. You know, it has to stop at that point, right? Okay, so we know it's recording, that's fine, because uh, the green bar is here, and then the audio bar is also, you know, indicating that it's, you know, it's active. So we are good, okay, we do have recording. I just sent an announcement, you know, to the whole class um, of the URL, you know, of the video that we are recording tonight. So um, it is unlisted, but it's not public, and it also, it's also not private. So what that means is if you have um, a mobile device, you can actually watch this, 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 the stream you know, right now with a you know, about 20 second delay or lag time. So it's, you know, it's, it's for people who have you know, accessibility needs you know, because you know, now they can feed the YouTube to a captioning you know, program and then be able to actually you know, access the content. So it's kind of cool this way, you know, there's still a 20 second delay, you know, but it's not that bad. I just have to talk slower. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and get started because we got some interesting topics today. Um, and hopefully everybody got a chance to work on the lab on Tuesday. So regarding the lab situation, I did talk to the dean right before I come over here. The dean said, you know, there's no way, no other way around, you know, attending the lab, okay? But, you know, if you're in the second lab and the first lab has room, you know, somebody has left already because they're done, then you can come earlier, okay? But we cannot let people work on the lab stuff at home. So that was the, uh, that's what the dean told me, okay? So. So now that part is official, <clears throat> because I do understand, you know, it's kind of late, you know, for most of you to go home. You know, if you get home by 10, 10, 30 or so, you know, that's really a hassle, um, especially if you work in the day and then you have, you know, like early morning stuff to do tomorrow, okay? So I do too, you know, I have to drop off my son, you know, early and then the cat's always waking me up by 5 a.m., okay, because they want food. <clears throat> yep. So if we're on the wait list, we should just drop them. We can't be added. So if you're in the wait, so that's a separate issue. Okay. So wait list, you know, um, the dean said, you know, the dean reminded me that I'm not going to pay more because I'm adding more people into the class. And I said, it's okay. You know, I understand that because they do pay more when the class is bigger, but they, but I have to tell the dean ahead of time 
and say that, okay, I'm an anticipating like 70 students, which is a certain percentage over the original enrollment amount, then you know, she can pay me more because of the extra enrollment. So they cannot do it after the fact. Like, you know, oh, okay, you know, a lot of people show up and you know, uh, you know, there are more people than anticipated. So we cannot retroactively change the pay because of that. So the dean reminded me of that. And I said, it's okay, you know, I can just add a few people. It's not a big deal. It's the lab situation that I'm more concerned about because some people, you know, kind of, I understand some people in the second lab wants to be able to get home a little bit earlier. So the idea, the idea is, you know, if you see a spot open, you know, in the lab, you know, even when you're in the second lab, you know, you can kind of come a little bit early instead of starting at the second lab time spot. So I'm, I'm not really sure, you know, when people will start to, you know, kind of leave the first lab. It all depends on the lab activity itself on that particular day. So, but that's kind of the general situation. Do we have any questions about the lab situation? If you're on the wait list, I will send you the permission number sometime over the weekend. So you'll be added, you'll get the permission number to add to the class, but at least I think everybody should have access to Canvas at this point. Question? So uh, let's, let's suppose that we are stuck in the middle of the like, quiz. Can uh -huh. you go and fish it at home? Yes, you can. So depending on how the deadline is set up, so typically the lab has a deadline set up you know, at least two days, you know, maybe up to a week. So you can get it started at the lab, you know, do a part of it, and then do and then finish it, you know, later, you know, somewhere else. So that is possible. But the idea is you have to start it at the lab. There was a question back there? Nope. Yep, go ahead. What about for someone who's not on the wait list? If you're not on the wait list, did you send me an email with your ID? No, I'm, I'm crashing this class today. I'm from Saxony. Okay, you're from Saxony. Um, huh? State. From Sac State. Um, I think it's one more is not going to kill me. <laughs> well, I'm going to die eventually. So, <laughs> just like everybody else, we all have the same destination, right? I mean, so, so don't uh, look forward to that destination. Just kind of enjoy the ride. Yes, go ahead. Yes, more or less. <laughs> All right, so what we'll do today is we're going to start with physical states. We'll start with um, things that we use to implement computers. Okay, so that's, we are, that's where we are starting. Um, on Tuesday, at the end of Tuesday, I kind of started to talk about how I'm laying out this class. We start with you know, the tiny little components that we use to make computers, and then we make you know, more logical units out of it, like logic gates. And then we build adders, and then we build flip-flops, you know, memory units and whatnot. And then eventually we'll build the actual processor out of these components. Okay? Once we build a processor, we'll figure out you know, how the processor works. Okay? How do we move you know, copy data from here to here? How do we add these two numbers together? And then we store the result or the sum to this location in memory, blah, 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 blah. So once we figure out all the baby steps that the processor is capable of doing, then we look into C, C++ constructs and go like, okay, here's a C statement. What does it look like in assembly? Now we you know, get into the, assemb the actual assembly language programming. So that won't start until maybe week 10 or so. So what do we do from week one to week 10? We build the processor, okay? So this is not the usual you know, assembly language programming class where the first class you know, starts with, okay, these are the mnemonics, okay, and this is the assembler, let's start programming right away. Okay? I don't do it that way because um, it is not about the syntax. Asse assembly language programming is never about the syntax. It is about how things operate inside the processor. So if I just start talk to talk about the syntax of assembly language, then people will just equate the syntax to, oh, so this is why that is happening in the processor. Nope, that is not the case. The syntax is nothing more than a notation so that it's easier for us to specify instructions that the processor can natively understand. So we'll get to that point, okay, somewhere around you know, week 10. Um, so right now we'll start with very simple, easy, well, I wouldn't say easy, but very simple stuff, low-level stuff. Okay? Yep? Will we cover like why the CPU is sometimes faster than the CPU in some operations? Or this kind of stuff? 
Um, could you ask it? GPU? So, okay, so I can, I can sometimes you know, digress a little bit and answer questions like that. The GPU or the graphical processing unit is not designed like a CPU or the quote unquote central processing unit. The GPU or the GPUs, okay, because they're always in multiples now, they are designed to carry out certain math operations really, really fast. But they are not general purpose, which means if you want them to do like, uh, okay, I'm just trying to think of an example here, Dijkstra's algorithm, okay, or some other general purpose programs, they're not designed for that, okay? But the point is, you know, they're each one, each GPU is not really that big, okay? You know, the core is pretty small, so it can fit a lot of GPU cores within the same, you know, um, area that you use for main CPU. The, the reason why your graphics card is so much faster when it comes to rendering you know, games or videos and whatnot is because you know, they can all be parallelized. So what you, what you can do is to kind of just imagine this screen here. Okay? So imagine you're playing a video game. Okay? So there are objects okay, in a video game and you need to render the objects. Right? So the way if you have a single processor, the way it gets things done is kind of, it's still using a ray tracing type of mechanism. So it's basically just looking out you know, from, the, from your perspective through a virtual screen and see what is hitting. And then it can bounce off your know, things and then it will calculate the color of that particular pixel. Then it moves on to the next one. Then it moves on to the next one, then it moves on to the next one, blah, 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 like that. So that's, that, that, can be, that can take a lot of time, right? So imagine you have GPUs now. You have let's say 256 GPUs. So now what you do is you chop the screen up 16 by 16, okay? And then what do you get? Let's see, is it 16 by 16? No. 256 is the squared of what? It is 16 by 16. Okay, so, so you chop the screen up, okay? 16 columns and then 16 rows, okay? Each cell is what a single GPU is responsible for. And all 256 GPUs are working at exactly the same time. And that's why you see, you see the speed up you know, when you have you know, GPUs. And when you have more GPUs on the graphics card, the faster it goes. It's almost exactly proportional. The, the number of GPUs on your graphics card is almost directly proportional to the performance of your graphics card. Um, yeah, well, each actual processor is now called a core because you know, the main processor now has multiple cores, and that's why we're counting cores instead of counting processors. Because when we say a processor, it can contain multiple cores. So, any other questions related to that? Nope. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we might you know, come back and visit stuff like that in maybe in the future. All right, so getting back to physical states. The first kind of you know, physical device uh, that people have used to implement computers are electromechanical devices. So as the name implies, electro means they use electricity, and then mechanical means you know, they have moving parts. So electromechanical devices are typically things that consume electricity as an energy source, but there are moving parts involved in order to connect or disconnect things. There are many different types of electromechanical devices that people have used to implement computers. Um, how many people have watched the imitation game? Okay, so you know, Alan Turing was using you know rotors. Okay, so a rotor is rotating a disc, and then on the disc are multiple electrical contact points. The contact points are routed on the disc to various other contact points. And, that, and by rotating the contact points, you know, the, a different contact point will um, attach or be connected to a stationary you know, contact. And that is how you know, they can kind of move th things around and change you know, the, the route of, of uh, the electricity. And that's how that, those computers were implemented. But in terms of modern day stuff, um, a relay is, th is a really good example. How many people know what a relay is? Okay, some people do. So a relay is, okay, if you just look up an automotive relay, 
and they're really common. I mean, they're very common devices. Yeah, let me see if I can. Okay, so these are this one here. You know, this is definitely a relay. So a relay basically is a switch. Okay, but how is it different from a switch like, you know, a wall switch that we that we have? The only difference is a relay switches the kind of quantity, physical quantity it switches is electricity. Okay, you kind of know that, but the, the quantity that is used to actuate the switch is also electricity. Is that okay? That makes it different compared to a wall switch because a wall switch needs mechanical means to change the state of the switch, and then the switch itself is switching electricity. A relay uses both, uses electricity in order to connect or disconnect electricity. Okay, so that's really important. Okay, that's really important because even though a relay is really slow, okay, because you know it's a mechanical device, there's a certain time lag between you know having the coil or the magnetic coil energized and the actual reed moving and then making a contact, and there'll be some time before it settles down because it does bounce around a little bit, okay? So it's not very fast, okay? It's a very slow device. But in terms of concept, you can implement a computer using just relays, okay? The problem of doing that is one, your computer is going to be very, very slow, okay? Because the device itself can only switch so many times per second. Now, how fast is your processor? What is the clock speed of, your, of a processor that you use on your cell phone? It's in the range of gigahertz, okay? Sorry? Okay, so 2.5 gigahertz, right? So, I can, so if we are only concerned about the order of magnitude, it'll be in the range of gigahertz, of billions, billions of times per second, right? Relays can, at the most, do maybe four times per second. <laughs> so if we implement computers using relays, then you'll be measuring the clock rate at like four, okay, four clocks, you know, per four ticks per uh, per second. If you have a souped-up version, you may have five, <laughs> okay. And it's also con going to consume a lot of current, okay? Because the way relays work is they have to energize a coil to create or to uh, convert into a magnetic field. And then the magnetic field is the one that changes the state of the, um, of the read to change it from con con contacting to non-contacting or the other way around, okay? But the coil consumes a lot of current. And anything that consumes current is going to generate a lot of heat or convert electricity into heat. So if you build a computer using relays, it's going to heat up a lot, okay? It's going to take a lot of energy. So we don't like to use you know, um, electrical, electromechanical devices if we don't have to. So the next one up, okay, in the notes, okay? So I'm not really going through um, the actual details of each mechanical, each device, each kind of device. Um, until we get to transistors. So the next one up are the vacuum tubes. So vacuum tubes, as the name implies, is a tube that is near vacuum because nothing is actual vacuum, not even outer space, okay? Outer space is actually not entirely vacuum. It actually has particles and other kinds of stuff in it. But vacuum tubes are near vacuum, you know, enclosures, and then inside they have a heating element, okay? At the very core, there's a heating element. The heating element is not for producing light. Its only purpose is to heat up um, what we call the, the cathode, okay? The cathode is the part that emits electron. So as it turns out, if you heat up metal in vacuum, electrons are quite ready to leave the surface of the metal, okay? They're just kind of floating around, but they're not exactly attached to the surface of the metal that is heated up in vacuum. So the idea of a vacuum tube is you have an external field outside of the cathode in order to kind of encourage the electrons to leave the surface of the cathode, which is already heated up. And then there's a collector on the outermost part to collect the escaped electrons, okay? But the bottom line is 
whatever the relay can do, okay, using electricity to switch electricity, a vacuum tube can do it as well. Okay, so from the, um, from the uh, abstract perspective, that is the bottom line, okay? You can use a particular physical quantity to switch or to control the flow of the same physical quantity. So vacuum tubes are great compared to mechanical devices or electromechanical devices because they, are not, they have no moving parts and therefore they are faster, okay? So we are probably talking about, I'm just guessing here because I'm not a vacuum tube kind of guy, um, I'm going to guess about kilohertz in terms of clock speed, okay? So we are going from multiple cycles per second to multiple thousands of cycles per second. That's a huge increase, okay, if you think about it. So that's why, you know, once vacuum tubes become inexpensive enough, people start to build computers or mainframe computers using vacuum tubes. Are we good so far? Okay. But vacuum tubes, you know, even though they're faster, they're still pretty energy hungry because you have that heating element. You have to heat it up in order for it to work. So they're always kind of glowing, you know, kind of low, like a, a darker red type of glow. Um, and because of that, they also have a limited lifespan, okay? Because anything that glows, okay, anything that heats up in vacuum eventually will no longer work. How many people, yes, go ahead. Can you show the image of the vacuum? Yes, absolutely. In fact, I will show a particular type, which is called a triode. So a triode is the simplest um, vacuum tube device that can switch electricity using electricity. And this is kind of what it looks like. It has got two anodes, in the, uh, two cathodes in this case. So what you see glowing here, that's just the heating element. And then you have, you know, kind of like a mesh. You can barely see it through these, uh, through the collector. But if you see the mesh inside here, the mesh is uh, the, uh, let's see, that's the base. Okay, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the terms. So this part is the emitter, the outermost part is the collector, and the mesh here is called the base. Um, and that's kind of, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the scale is, but I would assume it's about the size, like maybe about yay tall and about this much in terms of a diameter. So they're not really small, okay? They're actually pretty good sized, and that's kind of a good thing because you have to replace these things you know, uh, occasionally, or, you know, they, they only have a limited lifespan. The reason why they have a limited lifespan has to do with a physical phenomenon called Sublimation. How many people know that term? What is sublimation? Go ahead. Yep, yep. It's it's a it's a phase change because solid, liquid, or gas is what we call a phase. So it's a phase change directly from solid to gas. Okay, and all metals do that. It's just to a varying degree in vacuum. So what happens is you know, the, heating, the heating element, the metal of the heating element will basically vaporize itself, okay? Literally vaporize itself. So the vapor will basically just disperse over the entire thing and it will, um, it will get deposited at the coldest part of the enclosure, which is typically the glass enclosure. That's why you will see you know, these things you know, darken over time because the metal get vaporized and then it deposits onto the glass of the vacuum tube. So you can kind of use that to gauge you know, how much life is left on a particular device. And by the way, that's also what happens to the, the, the halogen headlamp of cars. You know, is, you know, over time, you know, the tungsten, which is you know, uh, what is producing the heat and then the light, is basically vaporizing itself until it disconnects the circuit. Then you have no light anymore. Go ahead. No, it's still vacuum. It just the, the, the heating element is no longer one solid piece of filament. It disconnects itself because you know because it gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and then sooner or later, some place with you know along that filament just breaks. And then the the problem is you know it also accelerates the process itself. It, it, it accelerates its own death over time. All right. 
So that's vacuum tube. If you are interested in how it works, Wikipedia actually does explain how a triode works. And it's kind of fascinating for those people who want to know, you know, I really want to know how it works. That's me. Okay, so now we're moving on to transistors, okay? So transistors are even better because they are what we call solid state, okay? So comparing transistors to vacuum tubes, both do not have moving parts, but transistors are called solid state devices. So they are really kind of cool because they can be made very, very small, okay? So if you track down here, Hmm. I didn't quite mention when people start to use transistors to implement computers. I believe it is in the late 50s, latest in the early 60s. Okay? So we have been using transistors for a long time, for decades. Okay? But how would you compare the speed of a mainframe computer made in the 60s to a computer that is made yesterday, just rolled out of the production line yesterday? Would there be any comparison? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so transistors, unlike me electromechanical devices or vacuum tubes, can shrink over time. Okay, you know, as people improve the production, the manufacturing technology, and also technique, they can make transistors smaller and smaller and smaller. But they're still operating at the same kind of principle. So that's the, kind of the interesting part about computer science is, you know, um, as devices get smaller, they get faster too because, you know, there's less state to change, you know, less momentum, so to speak, okay? So the smaller the device, the faster it can switch and then the faster computing power we have and they also save a lot of power, okay? If you have a Fitbit on you, okay, your Fitbit probably will outcompute a mainframe computer in the, in the 60s. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, you know, your, your Fitbit probably has more memory compared to a mainframe computer in the 60s. I think most relays from nowadays is that I do the OS time instead of uh, the actual Okay, so the question is, you know, what is limiting the computational power of devices that are modern, right, current? So there are a few, okay? You know, one has to do with input-output. You know, how fast can you pull data out of the hard drive? I know most people do not use hard drives anymore. We use solid-state you know, drives. But nonetheless, a solid-state drive still needs time to read. It also needs time to write. Okay, so the I.O. time is one of the main bottlenecks, you know, even though we are not using uh, hard drives anymore. The second one you know, has to do with um, inside the processor itself. You know, this is one thing that we are not going to talk about in this class much. Inside the processor, now remember a processor die or a silicon you know, uh, device is a two-dimensional device. Okay? For the most part, you know, it's two-dimensional. So now, you know, if you want to route you know, a particular item, like a register, we'll talk about registers in this semester too, to another register, there are only so many ways to do it on a plane because you have routing limitations. So that becomes a bottleneck as, as well, is you know, how fast can you move things around because you cannot have complete connection between all the pieces that really should connect to each other. So there, there are multiple um, thresholds, I mean, multiple uh, reasons why we have um, limitations of you know, how fast we can make things. So once we can make uh, computational devices that are no longer planar, I think you know, we'll see a you know, vast improvement in terms of speed. Okay, so are we good so far with this? Okay, so just like um, vacuum tubes and also electromechani electromechanical devices, a transistor is capable of using electricity to switch electricity, to control, you know, basically, are we connecting or are we disconnecting electricity? Is that okay? All right. So we'll look into um, two particular devices in this case. Um, but we'll get to that a little bit later. 
Now, physical states, you know, is really just, um, it just talks about you know, what kind of physical state do we use you know, as the quantity that we are switching and that we use for switching. Electricity is one, okay? But it doesn't mean that you can only implement computers using electri electricity. You can use water, for instance, okay? You, know, you can use you know, water that is moving to turn on and turn off you know, um, valves to switch another flow of water, okay? So if you can make devices like that, and I'm pretty sure, pretty sure they do exist, you can build a computer using those. If you have a device that makes use of light, okay, in order to connect or disconnect, you either to cut or to allow the flow of photons, you can make a photonic you know, computer. So what quantity we use you know, to do things is not really important. The idea is the device has to use the same physical quantity to control the flow of the same you know, physical quantity. It can be electricity, it can be photon, it can be a whole other variation of stuff. All right. So now we look into uh, representation. So in computer science, you know, we'll see later on that all computers, all modern day computers, are not only digital, they're also binary, okay? What is the difference between a digital device versus a binary device? Which one is more specific? Mm, binary is more specific, because everything that is binary is automatically digital. Because binary says there are only two digits, zero or one. So, Anything that is binary is automatically digital, but it's not like everything that is digital is automatically binary. Okay? The reason why we have things that are binary is because it is easy for the uh, device to maintain the state. Because the state is either on or off. Okay? We don't have to say how much on is it or how much off is it. It's just really, oh, is it on or is it off? Okay, so since you mentioned you know, quantum computers, okay, and I have watched a few videos on <laughs> quantum computing. Um, so quantum computers depend on, um, so there are different states, okay? So in, um, they typically use the spin, okay? Or there are other, or polarization, depending on whether you're dealing with light or electrons, you know, or whatever thing you're, you're trying to use to observe the state. But the state is still binary. So the spin is either clockwise or counterclockwise, and then the polarization is either horizontal or vertical. So they're still using, um, there are only two states per thing. But the idea of quantum computing is you can stack states onto the same thing. You know, it's called superposition. But in order to know the state of that thing, which now is the superposition of multiple things, you have to sample it multiple times because each time you sample it, it will only give you one answer. But you have to keep sampling it until you get a relatively sure answer what state it's actually in, what the superpos superposition state really is. So quantum computing is really interesting. You know, quantum physics itself is really interesting. Um, if anyone has an interest in quantum physics and also computer science, guess what? You have the future. Because quantum computing is going to happen. It's just a matter of time. Uh, I think Google has one, has one quantum computer. And then IBM just looked and go like, yeah, we got that working a long time ago. <laughs> and I would not be surprised if Facebook is working on its own or the Navy is working on its own, you know, and so on. Because the idea of a quantum computer is it can perform computations a whole lot faster compared to a conventional computer. And the first thing people want to do is to crack encryption. So, yeah, go ahead. So, is physics the best method for computer science for that one? Say that one more time. Is physics or computer science the best method for I would say you still need a solid computer science background, and then you need to have a reasonable understanding of quantum physics to get into quantum computing. So, it depends on whether you're making the quantum computer or you're trying to theorize what you can do with a quantum computer. 
if it is the former, then you need to be a physicist first, a quantum physicist, if you want to build a quantum computer. But if you say, okay, let's assume people figure out you know, how to do this, okay? And I'm just focusing on how do we program a quantum computer, you know, what kind of problem a quantum computer can solve a whole lot faster compared to a conventional computer and stuff like that, then you need a computer science core first and then have a quant an understanding of quantum physics just so that you understand you know, what you're dealing with, what is the underlying mechanism of the computer. Okay? So that's kind of important you know, to kind of mention because I think your generation or, okay, that's, okay, if you're about 20 or so, you know, your generation will probably see the emergence of quantum computers which is going to change a lot of things, okay? It's going to change a lot of things. Uh, one thing about quantum physics is entanglement. So does anyone want to explain what is quantum entanglement? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one way to look at it. There was a hand back there too. Does anyone else want to uh, add to it? No. Nope. Okay, that was a, that was a hand a little bit earlier. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so the idea of quantum entanglement is actually a little bit more interesting than that. Okay, because you you capture the main essence of quantum entanglement. So, quantum state is interesting because until you observe it. It's kind of like that, okay? So, so that's one interesting thing about quantum physics is until you observe, okay, it, you don't know what it is, okay? It's just a wave function, okay? So the best way to explain what it is is it's, everything is just a wave function. It is not a particle. It does not, quote, unquote, exist until it has to exist, okay? Until you observe it or something, it has to hit something. Then it suddenly just appears out of nowhere and go like, I'm here, okay? So quantum entanglement is saying that, you know, if you produce two photons, okay, from the same event, okay? The two photons, one goes this way, the other one goes the other way, okay? The polarization of the photons, you know, can be, is unknown, okay? It's just a random distribution. Is that okay? So let's just say the photon that goes this way, you know, hits something. You observe it. You look at it and go like, ah, this is horizontal, you know, um, polarized, okay? Right at that moment, the other photon over here is going to be polarized. I cannot remember whether it's exactly the same or the opposite, but they are they're correlated 100%. If that one is observed to be this, this one has to be that. That is quantum entanglement. So it has a lot of implication in computer security as well, in communication. Because there's no way to fake communication anymore. Because the two photons are entangled. Okay? If someone were to capture one of them and then reproduce it, they wouldn't be able to um, match the polarization. Yeah, so there, there are videos out there, you know, I think one, is, one was produced by Nova or PBS, you know, I cannot remember which one, um, that actually talked about, you know, um, the, some company in China is already using quantum entanglement for secure communication, and they plan to launch satellites so that, you know, people can use uh, quantum entanglement to have global communication that is secure because of the quantum effect. So kind of cool stuff, okay? Yeah, so if you're interested in quantum or in physics or in quantum physics, you know, I think there's a lot of possibilities. All right, so we look into transistors. So I'm hoping this looks familiar because of the lab on Tuesday. This is what we call an N-type transistor. And now there are two main types of transistors. One is called BJT or bi, BJ, bi-junction transistor, and then the other one's called a MOSFET, or FET, F-E-T, or field effect transistor. Not exactly things that you have to remember, because what we are interested in is really just logically, how does it work, okay? So this is an N-type transistor. 
and then we have a different type called a p-type transistor down here. And you can see that other than the orientation of the arrow, which we can rotate and flip, you know, and stuff like that, the only difference is the little bubble, okay? So the only difference is the p-type transistor has this little bubble here, and then the n-type transistor does not have that bubble. That's the only visual cue which one is which one. And then both have an arrow. The arrow is always indicating the flow from source to drain. In other words, in the case of an N transistor, you know, drawn this way, this N here is the source, this N here is the drain. In terms of this particular P transistor, this is the source and this is the drain. So the idea is the flow is always from source to drain. The third terminal, which is this one over here, or this one over here, is called the gate, okay? So the gate is kind of the control line, okay? You know, that is how you specify, okay, hey, transistor, I want you to stop the flow, or I want you to allow flow, okay? So that's kind of the deal of the N-type versus the P-type transistor. So why is one called the N-type and the other one is called the P-type transistor? The N-type transistor is mostly made out of N-type uh, semiconductor, okay? And then the other one is made out of mostly P-type transistors, a P-type uh, so, uh, semiconductor. So I'm not gonna get into semiconductor stuff, you know, because it's way beyond the scope of this class, even though some of that is discussed, you know, in the notes. But the idea, okay, well, actually, let me, let me get back here. Okay, right here. So the idea is with an N-type transistor, it allows flow, it turns on, okay? It connects or it closes the circuit. All of those are saying the same thing, okay? We are just turning on and say, okay, flow is allowed. With an N-type transistor, flow is allowed when the gate is a one or true or high, okay? Take any one of those because they're all synonymous in this class. Is that okay? Whereas with a P-type transistor, it's the opposite, okay? When the gate has a high voltage, it stops the flow. When the gate has a low voltage, it allows flow. Yep. So the bubble acts like the negation. Yes, and that's why we have the bubble, because it is negation, okay? So the devices, because of the physical, quant the physical characteristic, has this quote unquote negating effect. Are we good so far? An N-type transistor allows flow when the gate is high, and then when the, when the gate is low, it does, it does not allow flow. And then the P-type transistor is exactly the opposite. When the gate is high, it stops flow. When the gate is low, it allows flow. Are we good so far? Yep, go ahead. Okay, so all transistors can be in between fully on and fully off, okay? All transistors can do that. And that's why, you know, when you put on your headphone, okay, you know, if you have a good quality headphone and a good quality mobile device, you, you can hear, you know, close to the original fidelity kind of music, right? But that's all because, you know, transistor can be partially on instead of just all the way on and all the way off. Just kind of imagine if your, if your headphone is either all the way on and all the way off, what type of music are you going to be listening to? The kind of music that we used to deal with in the 70s with the old, old Apple II computers <laughs> or Atari, okay? So they're not going to sound very good, okay? So the fact that you can listen to music, you know, using your AirPod or whatever is because transistors can be partially on. But in computer science, we, we don't want transistors to be partially on because it becomes di difficult to duplicate the state of one transistor to another transistor, okay? So let's just say that one transistor is 71.5% on, okay? Of, of the full potential to allow flow, it is 71.5% on. Are we good, okay? And I say, I want to copy that to another, to another transistor. Well, that turns out to be pretty difficult. Okay, but if I say this one is on, yep, okay, I want that one to be on too. That's pretty easy. 
Okay. I can give you an analogy. I think this one works. If I want you to copy the answers of a Scantron onto another Scantron, eh, that's not too difficult, right? Because it's, oh, this bubble is filled up, this one is filled up, this one is filled up, and so on. Now, if I want, to, want you to copy a hand, you know, written, you know, note to another piece of paper, and you're supposed to make an exact copy of the first one, that gets a little bit difficult, right? Because, you know, okay, this person writes the eye with a curl over here and a loop over there, okay? You have to replicate all that. That's not easy. But if, you, if it's just Scantron, okay? Oh, this person is kind of sloppy. Oh, I can see that bubble is only three-quarter filled, and I'm going to do a 100% fill. It's cool, okay? Or the other person has 100% filled, and you're just sloppy and go like, ah, uh, I think I'm just going to do 80%. It's still good. So does that make sense? It's easier to copy things when they are binary as opposed to when they are analog. Okay? All right. So getting back to this circuit. So we have a 2N, 2P circuit here, or 2N type transistor and 2P type transistor circuit here. And for anyone who's taking electronics you know, technology classes or have access to uh, a breadboard and have access to transistors, you can actually build this. Okay? You can build it on a breadboard and play with it and see if it works this way. Okay? So now we have two P-type transistors. Q1 and Q2 are P-type transistors. And then Q3 and Q4 are N-type transistors. You can see the arrows are opposite, right? The P-type transistors, because with a P-type transistor, the flow is from high voltage to low voltage. So that's why it has to be oriented this way. With an N-type transistor, the source has to be a low voltage, and then the drain has to go to the higher voltage. So that's why you know, when, when you work with an N-type transistor, the arrow has to go in this direction. Okay? So that's not really of main concern to us. Okay? As long as we observe the arrows, you know, things will work. So the question is, what does it do? Okay, what does this circuit do? <clears throat> so what we want to do is to analyze. Okay, now remember, you know, all computers or the kind of computers that we talk about in this class are binary computers. So things are either on or off, zero or one, true or false. So that applies to the input pins. X and Y are input pins, and then this pin over here that has no name is our output pin. So the input pin X and the input pin Y can either be a low voltage or high voltage each. So we have four possible combinations. Because each one can be a low or high, so we have now four possible combinations. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So if you have any questions at any time, please do not hesitate to ask. So instead of you know, just kind of reading my own notes here, I'm going to show you this picture. So in this picture, we have both inputs being low, okay? X is a zero, Y is a zero, or you can say they're both ground, they're both zero volts, okay? There are many ways to say exactly the same thing. So we want to analyze this circuit and find out, okay, so which transistors are on and which transistors are off, okay? So you remember with N-type transistors, if the input is a low, they are off, okay? And with P-type transistors, it's exactly the opposite. When the input is a low voltage, they're on. So now we know transistors Q1 and Q2 are on, and then transistors Q3 and Q4 are off. Are we good so far? OK. So what does it do? Well, instead of looking at transistors, this is one thing you can do okay, on your own notes, is you can just say, oh, since the transistor Q1 is on, We'll just draw a solid line from the source and connect it to the drain because it's, co it's connecting the circuit. It's closing the circuit, right? Same thing with Q2. We'll just uh, draw a solid line from its source to its drain because it is just completing the circuit. Are we good so far? What about Q3 and Q4? They're off. They're not connecting. They're open circuit. So it, it is as if they do not even exist. There's nothing here and there's nothing here. So that's one way to look at the configuration of this particular circuit. So now the question is, what is the output pin connecting to? What can it connect to? 
Does it have a path to connect to ground? Nope, because we got two places where the circuit is cut off. Does it have any path to go to the high voltage? It has got two paths, right? It can go through Q1, it can also go through Q2 because both of those transistors are on completing or closing the circuit. So when you measure the voltage at the output pin, it is as if you are measuring just the high voltage source itself. And as a result, we interpret that as a one because it is a high voltage. So are we okay so far with the analysis of this circuit? Or this configuration of the same circuit? Because we're gonna look at the same circuit, just different configurations. Yes? I'm not super clear on the directionality of these transistors. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does matter because the way it works is for an n-type transistor to work, the flow has to go from source, which is a lower voltage potential, to the drain, which is a higher voltage potential. So in order for the simulation to work, it does matter. Mm-hmm. So the flow is different. It is not, it's not referring to charge. It's not referring to electron either. It is referring to are we allowing things through from source to drain? And then for an n-type transistor, the source has to be a lower electrical potential. And then for a p-type transistor, the source has to be the one that has the higher electrical potential. And that has to do with how a transistor is built. Yes. Oh, okay, so sorry. So you're saying that, so the there was pointing downward for both the C-type, mm -hmm. uh, but you said, is there a way for that pin to get up to the high voltage um, and it travels up? Is that actually the flow, or is the flow going from high voltage down to the C-type? So it depends on what, it, what type of flow you're controlling. So in the case of a p-type transistor, the flow you're controlling is from positive to negative. And then the flow you're controlling from the perspective of an N transistor is, tra is the uh, flow of negative charge. So that's why they're opposite, because they are controlling the flow of different things. Yep. Okay. <laughs> they are not diodes. Okay, so technically speaking, each FET is a diode. <laughs> but it, we don't want to look at those as diodes, okay? So we'll, we'll just kind of keep the diode you know, discussion out of the, out of the discussion. <laughs> Because this is a very simplistic view of a uh, field effect transistor, but if you look at the real symbol an electrical engineer uses you know, for um, a field effect transistor, it's actually a whole lot more complex, and there's an implicit reversed biased uh, diode inside that diagram. So I'm not gonna get into the discussion why there's a diode inside the diagram, because it has to do with the construction of the field effect transistor. Yep. That is correct. Okay. Yep. So the so the reverse the reverse flow is always on because of the implicit diode. Yep. <clears throat> but we don't want to talk about reverse flow, you know, in the case of a transistor, not in this class. So are we good with this one? Yes. Okay, very good. Apps. That's good. Then we move on to the second one. The next one. 
So the next one has both inputs being ones or both being high. So now we look at this and go like, oh, that's not difficult to you know, figure out because you know, if both inputs are high, that means you know, the voltage presented to the gate of all four transistors are going to be high as well. So remember, if the input is high or the gate is high for a p-type transistor, they're turned off. So in this picture, it is as if Q1 and Q2 are not there at all. So the circuit is broken here as well as here. Are we good so far? Then you look at Q3 and Q4. Q3 and Q4 are N transistors. When the gate voltage is high, the device is on, or it completes the circuit. It closes the circuit. So in this case, you can just draw a solid line from the drain to the source, from the drain, oh, excuse me, from the source to the drain, from the source to the drain, and it completes it, the circuit. Okay? So in this case, electricity is going to flow like that. Or the, we can say the output pin is now electrically connected to the ground. Ground is just a fancy word to say zero volt. Okay? So that's why you know, the, the state of the output pin in this case is zero or low or false. Do we have any questions about this particular circuit? Yes? Well, there's nothing dumped to ground, okay? So the gate does not connect to the source at all. And that's why there's a little gap here. See this gap here? This is why a FET, a, a, um, uh, a field, effect trans field effect transistor, is, the full name is MOSFET, M-O-S-F-E-T. The M-O part is metal oxide, which is an insulator. So the gate actually electrically does not connect to the ground, to, uh, to the source, or to the drain. It is completely electrically disconnected. And it is called field effect because it is the charge at the gate that is influencing the type of semiconductor in the substrate of the rest of the transistor. That's why it's called a field effect transistor. OK, so the inputs are just deciding whether or not the gate is open or closed. Yes. But by itself, it has no current to speak of. Okay. Yep. So there's no current. There's no electron going from the gate to the source. Okay. They're, compl they're electrically disconnected. It is as if, they, it, okay, it's kind of like a capacitor, okay? So this is almost like a capacitor symbol because it is kind of like that. Okay. So are we good so far with this picture? Yes? Yep, go ahead. I thought, I thought for N-type, um, the source was the ground. The source is the lower one, yes. Yeah, the lower one, right? So why is the arrow going down? The arrow is indicating current flow. Current goes from positive to negative. Oh, okay. But the flow that it's controlling is negative charge. Okay, so, so, so negative charge goes in the opposite direction compared to the current. <laughs> now, don't ask me that is the case, you know, because you know, somebody decided you know, what is positive and what is negative and what is the direction of current. Wait, so the arrow you said was the direction of current? Current. Okay. Yes. And then the, the arrow for the uh, anti transistor is the direction of? Negative charge. Negative charge. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yep. So the source, the arrow is connected to the uh, ground? Yes. So the source, source is here, drain is here, and then the drain of Q4 connects to the source of Q3, and then the drain of Q3 connects to the output pin. So it's technically like a vacuum connector, but hmm? it's not actually connected, but like, uh, you have negative transistors that... Right, so the idea is... Right, so the, the idea is you know, uh, the output pin is now electrically connected to ground. So if you were to put a voltmeter on the output pin, it would give you zero volt. So are we good so far with this picture? Okay. 
So we're going to move on to the next picture, which is going to be the last one. What if one input is a zero and the other input is a one? That's the only one that we haven't looked at. So in this case, we have x being a one and y being a zero. So we now track down where is x connected to. x connects to the gate of q1. x also connects to the gate of q3. So in this case, the gates of q1 and q3 will both be experiencing a high voltage. Q3 being an anti-transistor is now saying, I'm going to connect, OK? But Q1 says, I'm a p-type transistor. I'm going to turn off. I'm going to disconnect. Are we good so far? And then we look at Y. Y connects to the gate of Q2. It also connects to the gate of Q, Q, uh, Q2 and Q4. I misspoke a little earlier. So as far as Q2 is concerned, it is an, it's a p-type transistor. It's experiencing a low voltage at the gate. So is it uh, connecting or is it not connecting? It's connecting. And what about Q4? Q4 also has a low voltage at the gate, but because it's an N-type transistor, is it connecting or disconnecting? It's disconnecting. OK, so this, that's why we have this picture this way. So we, we do allow flow this way. We do allow flow you know, from, actually it's from here to here. but this is disconnecting. Now, Q3 and Q4 are in series, which means just having one connecting doesn't complete the path. So there's no path from the output pin to ground. What about you know, to the high voltage? Well, Q1 is off. It's disconnecting. But Q2 is on. I just need one of those two to be on to have a path to go from the output pin to the high voltage. So I do have a path to go to the high voltage. And as a result, the output pin is a 1 or a high voltage. Yes? What if Q4 was actually connected at that point with the output pin? Or what if? Say that one more time. Q4 was connected. OK, so if you, okay, so if you cut off this line and then hook up either this line over here or have a separate line that gives this one a, a one, right? So now you have Q3, and then you, you're hacking the circuit. So the Q4 is also turning on, right? This is what we call a crowbar. Okay, in electrical engineering term, this is you know, has a nickname of crowbar, which means you have a short. So you have a short from high uh, source of high voltage to ground. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you this question, but don't do it. Okay, <laughs> just a question, hypothetically. Okay. What if I give you a really thick copper cable and pop open the car hood and I say, just connect the positive end of the battery to the negative end of the battery? <laughs> What's going to happen? OK. So you have to think about your physics class, OK? Think about your physics class. Okay, there's about a 12 volt of uh, electrical potential difference between the positive terminal and the negative terminal of your car's battery. Okay, you know, 12, 13.2 ish, you know, kind of volt. Okay, what is the resistance of that thick copper cable that I just gave you? Pretty low. Okay, right? Okay. So what is Ohm's law? What does Ohm's law tell you? I is current. Current is V divided by R, right? So V is kind of constant, you know, because it's 12 volts, right? And then R is really low. What, how low are we talking about? We are talking about maybe 10 milli ohms or so. 10 milli ohms is one hundredth of an ohm. So how much current are we going to allow to flow through that cable, at least for an instant? So we have 12 divided by a hundredth, which is the same thing as 12 times 100, which is 1,200 or 1,200 amps. OK? Yes, it, it does, right? <laughs> OK. So Ohm's law it also tells you, so, so now we have a voltage drop of 12 volts, right, ish. And then we have a current of 1,200. 1,200 amps. What kind of power are we talking about? What, how do we calculate power in a DC circuit? It's easy. It's current times voltage drop. 
So we have 12 times 1,200. So that will give you 14,400 or 14,000 or so. So we have 14,000 watts of power. Okay, then you can say, where is that power going to? Power cannot go away. They cannot disappear. They cannot be destroyed because it's just energy. It's converted, right? So we have 14,000 watts of power converting from electrical physical quantity to what? To heat. That's right. So how much heat are we talking about? What is, what, is the, what, is, what is the rating of your hair dryer? You get a top of the line hair dryer that can still be plugged into 110 volt you know, outlet. Okay, so you don't need a 220 <laughs> connection to power up your hair dryer. Okay, so what is the highest rating hair dryer you can buy on the market? 1500 watts. Okay, 1500. So the cable that I just gave you now is trying to dissipate 10 times the amount of heat compared to your hair dryer with no fan whatsoever, moving the air or cooling down anything. <laughs> what is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? It will glow. That copper wire is going to glow and burn your hand. Okay, but the battery is doing the same thing too. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> but okay, so but you don't want to do this experiment not because you can say that oh, but I got protection here, I got welding gloves on, and it's all good. Well, that's not the only thing that can go wrong, because guess what? That fourteen, uh, twelve hundred amp is also going through the battery, right? Because the electrons are technically going from one side of the plate to the other side, you know. In your, in your battery. So your battery has its own internal resistance, right? So it's going to heat up itself. Also, what's in your car battery? Sulfuric acid. And that sulfuric acid is going to boil. It's going to create bubbles. It's going to burst. And then you're going to have, you know, sulfuric acid, you know, out of the battery. <laughs> you can do that on your own. <laughs> Let's just say that bad things will happen. I have seen puddles of, you know, of jumper cables before. Like, you know, just a puddle of plastic. Here, on this campus. I think they were trying to jumpstart another car and then misconnected the cables. Yeah, bad things can happen. All right, so this is also important. What time do we have here? I forgot to bring my watch today. So it's still, it's 6, third, okay, so this is 32 plus 7, 39. So we got 10 minutes left, so that's plenty of time. This is important, okay? You know, all kinds of jokes is fine, but this is important stuff, okay? So when you look at X, Y, okay, the input pins, and you look at the output pin, we can now draw this picture, right? You know, this is just a truth table. It says if X is zero, Y is zero, then the output is a one. If X is a one, Y is a one, the output is a zero. If at least one of them is a one, is a zero, sorry. If at least one of them is a zero, the output is also gonna be a one. Okay, so we look, we look at this truth table and then we go like, well, does it resemble anything that we know? Sort of, right? It, exactly. It is kind of like and, but not. Yeah. Yep, it is a not and, okay? It's a nand, okay? N-A-N-D is negated and, okay? Negated and. So this little paragraph here basically just says, Oh, if you look at the output as W, okay, if I label the output as W, this equation describes it, okay? So this equation says W is the negation of X and Y, okay? You go like, well, that's kind of awkward, okay? Because, you know, we use AND in C and C++, 
What is this nan doing here? Or in mathematical symbols, you can use this, which is equivalent to that. It's just you know, substituting with mathematical symbols. Or if you use, um, you know, if you just use words, W is the not, the negation of x and y. So now we have a NAND gate. Okay. So first of all, we have just made the jump from physical devices, physical states, to a logic gate. To things that we can represent using C syntax. Is that okay? So that's a huge jump because we have just you know, stepped away from physical devices, and now we go back to oh, so these are Boolean operators. We are comfortable with Boolean operators. Are we good? Okay. But the problem is, well, what is the does NAND have a particular symbol in C or C plus plus? No. Now, as far as you know, because I, I don't speak too many languages, is there a natural language that has a single word, not other than NAND, that people use in daily dialogue that represents the negation of AND? Yes? Hmm? That's exclusive OR. Either OR is exclusive OR. It is not NAND. The reason why uh, either doesn't work, neither. Neither is the negation of exclusive or. No, it won't. No, it does not. Um, yeah, it, it does not because these two are supposed to be the same if it is either exclusive or or the negation of exclusive or. So, so no, um, so either, okay, this is going to look sound funny. Neither, either, nor, neither is describing this truth table. I'll say that one more time. <laughs> neither, as in the sense of English, okay, is describing either as a Boolean operator, nor neither as a Boolean operator. <laughs> Don't you just love natural language? <clears throat> no, not really. Um, so, so, there's, there's no, so as far as I know, there's, there's no natural language that makes use of the logical operator that we have just defined as the negation of end. Okay. So we, we have the usual and, right? So and in English, or conjunction in logic, actually has many words to describe it. And is just one. But the English word but, B-U-T, is also and. Think about it. OK, think of an example. My favorite is the beer commercial. Rich but not smooth. Okay, so that means you know, rich but not smooth means and not smooth. So the use of word, the use of the word but is only there to kind of enhance the contrast of something that is opposite to something else. But it still means conjunction. They're both true. Okay. Um, we use the regular word or. Okay, so or is disjunction by itself. We use either or. That's exclusive or. We use neither nor. That's the negation of exclusive or. But we don't have a single word for NAND. So what is this going to do? I mean, why, why is this important? So section 3.4 is going to tell you why. Because NAND, as it turns out, and so is nor. So, but we use NAND because we have a circuit that only does, does NAND. As, as it turns out, NAND can do everything else. If you make enough of them and stack them up in, a different, in different ways, that's all you need. Because the negation of x can be expressed as x NAND x. Does that make sense to you? The negation of x and x is really the same thing as the negation of x. Right? Yes? OK. So what about x and y? Okay. So we have x NAND y, NAND, x NAND y. 
How does that work? X and Y by itself is the negation of X and Y. Yes? X and Y is the negation of X and Y. Yes? So, and then we get back to this one. The same thing, nanding itself, is really just negating itself. So the negation of X and Y, the negation of that is just X and Y. It works out. Now, if you're not convinced, okay, I encourage you to use a truth table to prove every single one of these equations, because you can. Yep. So the command table successfully reproduce any, like, Yes, it is. Yep. It is, it can be one of the only operator to reproduce all of the other Boolean operators. Yes. The one ring. There we go. The precious gate, yes. OK, so what about x or y? OK, this is x or y. OK, we throw the or into NAND, OK, see how you deal with it. So as it turns out, OK, so does anyone want to argue that uh, the negation of a negation just kind of cancels out? We know that, right? OK, so negation of negation. And then we take this negation and we distribute the inner negation into x and y. But we have to change the or into an and. This is by De Morgan's law. Okay, so we'll talk about De Morgan's law in the class as well later on. But that is a valid Boolean algebra operation. Okay, so you take the negation of an or, and you can distribute the negation into the inside of the or. But then you have to change the or into an and. Okay, that's that's called De Morgan's law. So now we have the negation of the negation of x and the negation of y. So I look at this and go like, hey, we do have a negation of an and. So we have a negation of an and, OK? But the inside would be the negation of x and the negation of y. So we have this and we have that. But, that, but those two is simply x nand x. And then we have y nand y. So the bottom line is x or y can now be expressed as x nand x nand y nand y. So all the usual Boolean operators that you use in C and C++, they can all be replaced by nand. Yes? They are ways to connect things that we do not yet know to things that we already know. So we start off with transistors, right? You know, and transistors, as far as we are concerned, are really just devices that make use of the same physical quantity to switch the flow of the same physical quantity. It can be light, can be electricity, can be flow of water, can be flow of air. No, not yet, not yet. So we are just connecting to operators that we know of. Okay, so now we know how to use transistors to implement logical negation, which is a single exclamation point in C. We know how to use transistors to make an end. Okay, you know, it's just you know, barely you know, covered up here. Okay, because it can be expressed as NAND, and we know 2P and 2N transistors can make a NAND gate, right? And then we also know that we can do something slightly different in order to implement OR. So all the logical operators that you already know in C and C++, negation and OR, can be implemented using NAND. So what is the big deal about NAND? It can be implemented by 2P transistors and 2N transistors. So now we are connecting concepts that you know of as Boolean operators to physical devices. So we can actually build physical devices to perform those operations. Yes? So one of the Yes. Now, it may not be optimal, but at least there's one way to do it. Okay, if my concern, if my concern is just, okay, I see this AND operation that I want to do here in a programming language, can I do this using a physical device? The answer is yes. 
Even though this way of doing it may not be optimal, it is a way of doing it. So we are connecting physical devices and physical quantities to logical concepts and logical operators. That is the big gap that we are bridging today. Yep? The man's kind of like the quadratic formula in the sense that it always works. It can be used to replicate all other logical operators. Yep. Mm -hmm. The logic of and or nand, nand. You can see how it's the opposite of regular and, right? Because with a regular and, the only time you get a one out of an and is when both inputs are ones, and then for everything else you get zeros, right? This is exactly the opposite. The only time you get a one, oh, the only time you get a zero is when you have both inputs being a one. If you have at least one zero, you always get the output of one. And that's why it's the opposite of a usual end, of a regular end. Yep? Could we have used that A and B times third to build uh, or directly without going through the problem? We have built or directly, the or case? Um, I believe so. Because I just want to show that it is possible. Yeah, because the bottom line in this class is not so much you know, going for the optimal design. I just want to show you that it is possible. You know, it is possible to connect all the logical operators that you already know to the simple circuit that we have already built. Okay. So when we get to the lab, I'm going to open up a lab for tonight. So there's a new lab for tonight. Um, and it's going to be you know, basically revolving around uh, NAND as an operator. Okay. So I'll see you guys over at the lab.